Welcome to the next podcast from Melon Ramsey. This episode is with Christine Warren. This episode was made possible thanks to the support of our wonderful podcast sponsors. These include Hatter's Millinery Supplies, the Millinery Association of Australia, Catherine Cherry Millinery, Hat Academy, The Essential Hat, Hat Atelier, Louise McDonald Milliner, That Millinery, House of the Dawn, Lifted Millinery, and Hat Bank. You can find a link to each of their businesses in our show notes, either on your podcast app or through our website. Our podcast sponsorship is run through a platform called Patreon. We've recently introduced a new tier to our Patreon page. We're calling it Supporter. It starts from $5 per month. You can choose this as a base level or nominate your own value. We've introduced this category for those who would like to quietly show their support for millinery info. It is a way to help us keep producing the content you see on Millinery Info. Podcast sponsors are so important to us. So if you'd like to hear your business name mentioned and link included on our website, that is still the one to choose. We're so grateful for the support of our Patreons. The podcast series and other content on the website would not be possible without them. And with your support, we can continue to grow these resources. I invite you to visit www patreon.com forward slash millinery info to find out more or to sign up if you have any questions please let me know i'd love to hear from you um oh. thank you mm-hmm. so much christine for joining me today to chat hats it's so lovely to have you as part of our podcast series um mm-hmm. Let's start with how, what I think is a hopefully easy question is, how did you first become involved with millinery? Um, well, I first became involved in the um, late 80s, but before that, in the late 70s, I started the fashion course at um, our tech or CIT. Or, um, it's had a few names, but it's the um, School of Technology, you know, and um, so I did the fashion um, diploma or certificates as they called it back then and it was like three years of garment assembly and two years of tailoring and pattern making I finished all that and then millinery was a separate um, a separate component it was like a trade course so then I went on to millinery and then I did um, back then it was broken into four um, four units I suppose you'd call them, it was called summer, um, winter, bridal and hand tailoring and hand tailoring covered all wire work, covered hats, buckram and all foundations. But cinema wasn't in when I started millinery. (laughs) um, And a lot of the new materials today. So, um, So I did all that. And then when I finished that, I went on to do um, um, Certificate four in, in millinery, and it was run in Canberra, but we they used to get Jean Carroll to come to Canberra, and uh, and you could choose which way you wanted to go, what your main project was after two years, and I chose um, theatrical millinery. So you had to do a production, so I chose One Lake and decided, and you had to back up. You had to do all these project plans and um, costing and... And I said mine was running for two years, so you had to justify making a headwear that would last for two years and what you were going to do if it didn't and back up. And that was fabulous. And um, so when I was uh, about certificate two, I decided I I would start making hats. I felt confident enough to uh, run my own little business. And um, But I used to love hand felting because when I did... um, millinery uh the winter subject of millinery hand felting was part of it so we had to do wool felts fur felts and the the laws and then hand felting was part of it and most of the class hated the hand felting i just loved it i loved it that you started from just a ball of wool a um slither of wool they called them slithers and then you made these hats and being camber and cold I used to just make all these cloches and little bucket hats and I used to go to markets. So I started off at markets 
but it, the other side of it I just um, made um, was more practical hats I started off with when I first did it with sun hats or everyday winter hats and then a, a little bit of race hats and then as time went by I felt confident to go into race hats and then um, that was it so that was sort of the late 80s but before I while I was doing my millinery this is just a little snippet I'd finished my um, sewing and everything and then my husband and I didn't want to go back to work and he said no you can run your own business and by this time I had a third child and so I used to make skateboard clothes <laughs> While I was going to millinery at TAFE and then on the side I made skateboard clothes and sold them to two shops in Canberra and one in Melbourne and one in Sydney. Wow. So the millinery just took over, you know, once I... Um, my big breakthrough was that we had these markets in Canberra that were run by two girls and they it was just handmade stuff and they were up market, markets in an old building in Canberra. And that's where I really launched my business. And I've still got the same clients I met there. Wow. One day you'd go there and it was beautiful. We had to set up little shops and, um, you know, like little shop fronts. And, yeah, and it just um, grew from there. And, so and you make quite a variety of hats. Are those customers that you have from that time, are they race goers or are they wearing day, casual day wear hats? Um, uh, they, used, they go to the races. But they'd all want, because Canberra was so cold, uh, people wear, they'll come and get little cloches. And so I, I did a lot of, um, I, I still do a lot of hats for girls having chemo, um, brides. So I do a lot of bridal stuff. Oh, I'll make anything, <laughs> anything you want. <laughs> um, well, you've got such a breadth of skill to, yeah. to be able to do all of that as well. That's why I love doing all these workshops. Especially with Louise's ribbon workshops, because we learned all that, and I used to do it, but I never. Um, I thought, oh no, you know, I might do a band or something, or a cockade on a cloche or something, but I never thought of it in the way that Louise does it, and her, I haven't learned her techniques. And then I'll try and do something different so they don't look like Louise's, you know, so it doesn't. Um, that's that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about because you independently have such an amazing breadth of skills from your own training and your own work but you also do um quite a lot of like I'd say more recent more recent classes yes. um but you what I love about seeing yours is like you've done Louise's class and in particular you did Catherine Ellen's weaving class but yeah. you took that concept and transformed it into something something else and I was just wondering how how you go about that is that something you when you're going to the class you're going in thinking how am I going to change this what's that process yeah. like for you yeah well I do I do think that because I think I don't want to just copy their style because then they'll go oh she's been to Louise's class or uh, it's not fair to them you know, so, yeah, I go in thinking, where can I use that? And while I'm doing it, my mind's just ticking over and I'm thinking, oh, that might work with that or that. And um, because I work with braids a lot, and then I just thought, and it's really soft. Like it's, um, you can't feel it, but it is soft. Nothing pointy here. But um, I just thought, oh, I'll just see what it looks like with the braid. And it worked, was a bit hard on your fingers and you had to manipulate the braid a bit, but um, it was just really relaxing. And then I got really excited about doing it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I'm always thinking, oh, how will I do this? What will I use? And there's so many things that you can use. And you, you were yeah. talking about um, when, you, when you first began millinery, like cinema didn't didn't right. yeah. exist I know. yeah well when it first came in um Jean Carroll introduced us to it and so that was in the early 90s and she came and I was doing certificate four then and she came to Canberra and so they'd get her up here to teach us theatrical um, millinery because our millinery teacher didn't didn't have the experience and um she bought some cinema 
once and we were doing bonnets. We were doing 1840s bonnets and um, and she bought some cinema and she had a turban on and, and it was just a metre of cinema and you turned it over and you wrapped it around your head and you just squished it all and out like that. And they were all the rage back then, you know, and two tone. And the cinema wasn't very good. It wasn't like the quality we've got now. It was open, more, it was a really open weave. And then, um, so she introduced us to that and taught us how to work with that. And then we were all trying to buy it and there wasn't many places you could get it from. And then our, our millinery teacher just took the techniques of blocking foundations and applied it to, because um, she didn't even know about it. And there was, there was you know, YouTubes or anything around, you know, nothing on the internet. And so she just experimented and we experimented with her. And, um, and so that's how we did it. So we blocked it like we were blocking the foundation but didn't put anything on it. Yeah. Wow. And um, well, you, you've, you've now sculpted with it and make different shapes yes. as well. So that's something that's, I guess, evolved. You've seen the evolution of how it's been oh, used as well. Yeah. And, um, and the quality, the quality was the thing. It was terrible back in those days. It was really, <laughs> open. if you pulled it, and I'm pretty heavy handed because of felting, you know, like I'm not yes. good at embroidery because it's just real. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be ripping at it and... Um, um, but when, when they discovered the English one and, and you could get it in, they could get it in, I, th I think um, S.A. Browns or Hatters got it in first and, uh, and Preston's from Mill. Yeah. Um, then, and then the millinery suppliers were really helpful too because they had to learn about it. So they'd tell you um, how to do it. And, um, yeah, so that was pretty exciting. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. right. And so um, tell us about your studio space. Is this something, um, where is your studio space and how do you also, work I, I, I work from home. So I've got two rooms. Yes. And it's down the bottom of my house. It's outside. So yes. you've kind of got a, is that more of like a display customer space and then also like a more of a workshop? Yeah, this used to be two rooms and my eldest son used to sleep in this room. And then they've all gone. And then um, I took over all this. So I've got, and then my house is up there through that door. And then I work in here. And then that's where I put all my hats. Tom built me all these shelves years ago. So I perfected it over the years. But I always leave that door open and they can see all the mess and everything in there. But when I first started, it was all one room and it was upstairs in my house because in a spare room and I used to have to take my clients through the lounge room and I'd have to say to my, my three boys, go, go away, go away. <laughs> <laughs> and I was squashed in this little room. So it's really off spread out. Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when a customer comes to you, do you have lots of stock or pieces that they'll pick from or are they generally coming for a custom-made piece? How does that um, work? No, they know. Uh, lots of people know me. Now and they always, I always have like most of these shelves filled with something. Oh, that might be winter and summer. And then I have things that don't sell in the season. So when the seasons come, I put the winter ones out and I might just keep a few. And then I put the other ones away. And, um, and then the summer comes out and I might just have a few winter ones out. And then I've always got them in boxes underneath here. And um, so they'll either come to get something made or they want to have a look. And I've always got things there that they can try on. And, um, and so I've got, like, I'm a battle axe block. I'm on the bottom, back of the mountain, which is really nice. And then this is a double door, so they don't have to come into my house, even though this is part of the house. Um, and then I've got a spare bedroom. So some people want to get into the outfit. Yes. Yeah, so they'll come or brides will bring their brides dress. So I've got a bedroom just outside there, my guest bedroom, and they can get changed in there. So I've got it pretty well set up. And, uh, What's been some of the favourite favorite pieces you've been making recently? I got into a lot of um, berets 
in the um, winter with my hot blocks. You know yes. what hot blocks are, you know those hot blocks? Yeah, so do you use a whole lot of hot blocks? Yeah, it's so easy. And so I used to use my hot blocks for um, my hand felted hats. Mm-hmm. And I first, uh, we used to have them when I went to TAFE, but we only ever used to use the hot blocks for pressing um, the headbands and the hand tailored hats that were made out of foundations. We always used to block them just on a dome to get them all straight again. Yeah. And, um, but we never really blocked hats on them. And so I knew about them. And then Lorraine Gill, started to get them made and then the first Adelaide convention she I used to use them for my felting but she you could get more so I bought a whole lot of her yeah so I, you've got um not just dome blocks anymore you have like no, full I've got, I've got very a few awesome. shapes of them and yeah. I, I used to run before COVID oh there's groups of uh, girls in Canberra that just like to make hats they're not milliners but the just groups of textile groups or girls that sew and they'll ask me to run a workshop so I go to their place and they might have eight or ten girls and they have lunch I take everything <laughs> I always take the hot blocks yeah they might make a cloche or something and I've got yeah. quick ways on how to block a felt um on a thing and then they just wire the edge and they can get it done in a day. Yeah. And they look, and then they just wear it to work or wherever they go. Um, uh, they're good for that. Yeah. Not, yeah. But for your fur felt or velours, it's just like they nearly block themselves. <laughs> you make such vibrant um, colours in your pieces, a lot of uh, fuchsia pink and red combinations. Is yeah. that something, a combination you've always enjoyed or is that something that's evolved? No, oh, I've always liked um, red, even though I wear a lot of black, but I've always got red. I've got so much red jewellery and I always used to wear a red hat you know, or red shoes or a bag. And then pink. Pink I don't wear a lot myself, but a lot of people like pink. I find I can always sell a pink hat, a red hat. I can never, I don't make many blue hats, but I used to like blue a lot. I've so, I made a couple this year and green hats I have trouble selling. Some In some places it's bad luck to wear a green hat to a right. race day. I think, so, and in, in not all places though, I think, um, but definitely I've heard some people go, oh no, I can't wear a green hat to the race. Is that that's bad? That's bad right. luck. So I've heard that. <laughs> I, I have made a few green hats, but mostly, mostly I don't. I think it came from my felting because the felting colours I always used to do on burgundies, and I might I used to do them two sided. So when you turn turned a brim up, you might have had orange, and then it was burgundy on the top, and all that sort of hippie colours. I'm a bit of an old hippie, you know. <laughs> 70s, you know, orange. But, um, yeah, I just find pink. And, and I don't do a lot of combination colours. So I might do the same or uh, pink and red, you know, what I would sell because I go to a lot of functions here that you can, um, charity functions and pre-race functions, but mostly based on a charity um, um, lunch or something and I, I know that I can sell that colour you know or black and white or cream or something mm. I, I've sort of got that in mind too <laughs> you know? so when you're do you make a collection every season or have you got more of a, yeah. a flow of production going oh no, yeah I do do a collection so I'll I try and um, I love fashion and I love clothes so I always look to see what the next season's colours are going to be. And if there's something, you know, for one year there was a really bright green, so I did add a touch of green. <laughs> and a yellow, you know, sometimes it stands out. And I think, oh, well, I better have some of that because they'll come with their dresses or whatever, or I'll go somewhere. And so a lot of these functions I go to, they'll have their dresses with them or oh. something. Yeah. They come, they know they're going to get a hat. They're going to buy a hat, especially around race time. And that. 
Yeah. But getting back to my collections, yeah. I do. So I, I think about the colour first, and then I, I still like big hats. I still like hat hats. So I always do some big hats, and then um, just say some feature like big bows are in or something. But I don't really like to do it because it's in fashion. But sometimes. There's just something that's standing out that's current. And I confess I probably will use that, but put, do it your own way. Um, but mostly I just like, um, I like texture and I'll go for big hats and then I'll do little pill boxes. I like pill boxes. And then you can always make the pill box um, current. You know, it can be, it can still be a pillbox, but just the way you wear it or a new material, a bit of crin around it or, or um, something like that, or the way you put the bow um, and just bring it up to date. Yeah. yeah. Some of those basic shapes, I think, are just enduring. You know, they you can bring them back. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favourite hat that stands out in your, your mind that you've made? Um, the, oh, oh, I've made so many. Uh, oh, this is my favourite at the moment. <laughs> it's usually one of the ones, the last one I made, but I'm really liking this. And the reason I like this is that I've, I love it when I'm like a potter or something, you know, you just start from hardly anything, not from a hood or a capelin, and you've really, just, you've really made it. And that's what I love. You know, that you really, people don't believe me that I did that. They think I've blocked it, you know. But you did all that, yeah. You know? I suppose that's similar to your felting as well, making. Yeah, making and that's why I loved, I loved felting. I could just sort of walk where you're out of. <laughs> but I love textiles, yeah. So do you still um, do dressmaking as well, having uh, done not, the, not the course? Much. I, I, I did get into sewing um, in COVID and was hand sewing beret, you know, machine sewing the berets. And I hadn't done that for a long time with the leather. And then I used to teach millinery at the TAFE here. And um, so I was very hard on, and the, the girls, they were supposed to have had sewing skills before they joined the millinery, but most of them didn't. So I'd have to teach them how to. Oh, so you'd be teaching. So um, you were teaching what, 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 like certificate two and th three yeah, levels? Learned, yeah, and I was so desperate to get numbers that I said, I can't help teach them to sew. <laughs> but I'm surprised at how people just couldn't sew. Um, is does that course still run at the moment? No, they it just it finished. It was really sad, and we tried and tried, and I think the last class I had about six six students and the um, guy that was my um, supervisor, he led it through, but it just wasn't economical. And then um, I, ha I, I kept getting reviewed too by the, the, um, the training people. And I couldn't, I couldn't justify, well, I couldn't tell them where these millimeters were going to work, you know, because there was no jobs. And, and so back in the day, you could say you could work in a hat shop. There were more hat shops around or a miller might, might take on an apprentice, especially in Canberra. There was just nowhere. We've got no hat shops left. Yeah. Yeah. You know. It's quite a small industry. And so most yeah. of those students would go on to be launching, they'd have to launch their own businesses, I guess. So that's that's right. And one... One, one um, girl, um, Slovaka, she, I taught her, and so she, she still does it, um, part, but she's got another job, but she, she does it. And the others just, um, I still keep in contact with them, and um, oh, they, 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 they just do it to go to the races and their friends, and oh, they've probably got a few clients, but it was just too hard. And, um, um, and that, that's what happened because they just said, well, you know, because it was a um, certificate course and they're supposed to be able to find jobs and you can't recommend any rec um, any employment 
Um, and I couldn't even find anything in Sydney or Melbourne, you know, because they all get filled up by the local people. Yeah, it was pretty sad. And I, I was really wishing they'd go back to a um, sort of like recreational courses. Yeah, they used to have them at our TAFE too. And, and we did try to run that. <laughs> um, do you teach, do you teach privately now instead or yeah I do um I run workshops but my this area isn't big enough and so I've done it on one-to-one -one or two um but it's a bit squashy like I said I did those other workshops where I go to them so yeah. I did a lot of things where say it was somebody's 30th a girl and she wanted all her girlfriends and they make a fascinator so I do the kits yes I go to their place and I like that better or the, so they weren't milliners, you know, um, they were just people that wanted to make things. I've, and then there's a women's group here, that's the Majura women's group, it's young mothers or there's sometimes there's grandmothers there with the kids. And so the, the kids are minded in one room and you do fascinators with them. And I like that because I do with the kit and they've got to do something in two and a half hours. And that's what like a TAFE and you're learning the whole time that this doing workshops and ongoing learning I just find you're learning all the time you're even learning off your students you know because everybody thinks differently on how to make something you can all be given the same instructions and materials and everybody's piece looks different you know? that's um, so true that's so it? true it's so piece? important as well yeah and um, so I, I really enjoyed that. And, and then I used to, I did the ones at the millinery conventions, the ones in Melbourne and Adelaide, but I taught hand felting there. That's fantastic. Um, so what is some of your favourite tools in your workroom? Uh, I like my flower making tools. And I like my old, oh, this thing I'm working on at the moment, a bit of, Scott, I like this old poopy here. <laughs> Poopy yeah. head. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favourite things. And um, and I have to confess, I don't wear a thimble because I can't stand it. I said that in Zoom the other day. She's a rebel milliner. <laughs> no, there's something wrong with my thimble finger. I have got so many thimbles, so I can't say it's my thimble. I do it on to press things but I just cannot never from the day we were said to wear them no I can't just feel so awful on my finger I've got to flick it off and I can't sew with it on 40 years of millinery right here and I know. <laughs> <laughs> you can't beat a dome I always say a dome block you can make anything on um yeah. Right. And your favourite millinery material at the moment? My favourite oh, is braids. I love braids. I've always liked these braids. And when the glossy ones came out, I love them even better. But I've got boxes of braids from way back when I first started. And again, I think that comes from that I had a thing of a pile of braid and then you, you actually sort of made the whole base of the hat and everything this something that's um, deep inside me with, you know, just starting from nothing. Yeah, it always grabs me when I think of that. So how have you been keeping yourself yeah. occupied in, yeah. in COVID? Have you been, have you been isolated or what, what have yeah, you been so I was, I was isolated. This goes like this. I was isolated. So my, my family all live around, but because um, I'm on 73 now, so um, I, um, they said, oh, you're so old, you've got to, you, you can't see the grandkids, you can't see anybody, and nobody came near me. They did, I did drive by their place to wave to them, but I wasn't supposed to be out in my car. I live on the back of the mountain, so I used to I just go walking every day with my dog. And I've got a cat and chooks, and, um, and then I just started making stuff. And then with Zoom, which encouraged me on Wednesday, you know, what am I going to show them on Wednesday? <laughs> <laughs> so you've been joining in the Millinery Association. Australia's been doing stitch and chat. So you've been yeah. 
part I've of that. I've been on there every Wednesday since it started. <laughs> So you just kind of pulled all your materials out and just looked yeah. at them with fresh eyes and went, what can I make from you? That's what I, that's what I did because I thought I don't want to buy anything. And, um, and so I had all this leather. Well, I had bright pink and everything that I bought years ago from House of Adorn. And it's when all the leather flowers started. And I never made the flowers. I just I made a couple of leather hats, but I just, it just didn't grab me blocking the leather. You know, some people are really good. I just found it really oh, so much work. You know? And I just didn't grab me. So then I thought, oh, I'm going to make leather berets. And um, Instagram was good because I picked up followers from not here. And, um, and then they'd just uh, message me and I'd just, uh, they'd buy them. Not a lot, See? you know, some of them. And my cloches. Yeah, so you found um, your social media presence has helped expand your client oh, base. Oh, yeah, more than my, um, well, I have to fix up my website. I, I find Instagram really good. Yeah. I've got, you do a great job of posting and you, you yeah. share your latest mix as well, which must be very useful. Yeah. And, um, and it's a younger crowd. Yeah. At my age, don't get on Instagram. None of my friends get on Instagram. They all think I'm mad. <laughs> they should take a leave from your book, though. You're doing so well. <laughs> I'm just to tell them, you know, you fuddy duddies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of like Peter Pan, I think. But, um, Working, though. You're doing great. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it. It keeps me young. And I love being around all you young people. It keeps me young um, going, you know. And, and if I... I keep thinking that the Instagram keeps you up with technology to a certain point, you know. And I was glad I conquered Zoom, you know. Maybe I'll take a computer course. But... Look at you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, well, I think that's a lovely, I think that's a beautiful spot. So I'm going to wrap this up and say thank okay. you so oh. much for thank you. being part of our oh. podcast. It's so great to chat with you. Yeah, it was lovely to chat with you too, Lauren, and thanks for inviting me. And Thank you for listening to this episode with Christine. I'd like to thank our Patreon podcast sponsors, Hatter's Millinery Supplies, Kath and Cherry Millinery, Hat Academy, the Millinery Association of Australia, Hat Atelier, Louise McDonald Milliner, The Essential Hat, House of Adorn, Hat Mags, Fat Millinery, and Lifted Millinery. You can find a link to each of their businesses in our show notes. We're very appreciative of their support. We hope you've been enjoying this series. If you're a new listener, welcome. Scroll back through the episodes and enjoy the full series. We can't wait for you to find your favourites. Visit our website to explore the other amazing content available and subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you for joining us and I hope you've enjoyed this episode with Christine.